Hello and welcome back to another episode of the Cardboard Herald's Off the Table, your weekly gaming news in 10 minutes or less. So if you're joining us for news that isn't just announcements because we got some announcements, then you may know that we're in a bit of a slump. We're between Origins and Gen Con, so we're probably not going to be getting a lot of moving and shuffling these days. But we do have one big news item, and it's fitting that it's convention related, and that's that Dice Tower has announced that they are rebranding Dice Tower Con, the original one in Florida, to Dice Tower East, and they are taking back ownership and responsibility of the convention because apparently it was being managed by another group that was unaffiliated with Dice Tower utilizing the Dice Tower name with support of the Dice Tower but apparently they didn't have the 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 minute management of the convention which is what they want to have at this point they're going to be reducing the attendee and exhibitor size for their upcoming premiere convention now i would of course love to go to dice tower east but is it going to have the same player focus and smooth management that they have had at the convention up until this point because it has been stellar and what about the convention that this group is now planning on having in the future? Is there going to be a level of competition between the two conventions, or will they be able to sustain independent of one another? There are more and more gamers every year, and Florida is by no means a small state, so I'm hoping that they both can exist in parallel and gamers can enjoy all of that gaming in Florida and elsewhere. Come up here to Alaska. We got Platypus Con. That's going to do it for our news today. So we're going on over to announcements. Our first announcement is that there's a new edition of the Quest for El Dorado coming out, the Canizia deck building modern classic. And this is not the expansion standalone game that I talked about previously. No, this is a new international edition of the original game, which I think is very cool for a few reasons. One, if you've been watching the show for any amount of time, you know how much I love Vincent Dutre, and we're getting Vincent Dutre artwork on another Canizia game, which is always a win in my book. And it does have some interesting descriptions as far as the details of the game, in that it's going to have larger cards does this mean that we're going to just have the full bleed artwork and less iconography on the cards? Or does it mean we're actually getting larger physical cards? Because if you haven't played the game, you have those teeny tiny cards that everyone hates, but I secretly kind of like because I like having a tiny set of cards in my hand. But does that introduce problems with compatibility with expansions and retrofitting things if you don't have the old edition and the expansions are made for this new edition? I'm interested to see what's going to happen. If we get confirmation on any of those changes, I'll let you know in the video description below. And then Disney is talking about the new villainous expansion, teasing out some imagery, some silhouettes of the pawns for the new villains that are going to be in this one. And we don't have many details on this, but it looks like you're going to get to play with some of the missing favorite villains that weren't in the original base game, like Isma, Scar, and the Reapers from Mass Effect. And then finally, we have the super stylish looking video vortex coming from Mondo Games. Now, this is another deck builder. And I know I just talked about the quest for El Dorado. And I think that is such a breath of fresh air when it comes to the deck building genre, which I've largely grown tired of. But the artwork and the premise of this game is so cool sounding and looking that I can't help but want to check out this two to four player competitive deck building game. So listen up, it's a post-apocalyptic earth with video obsessed mutants. So call up Longshot because this sounds like the secret mojo verse board game that I never knew that I wanted. Now, our highlight today. Normally I talk about one specific creative project, something that I want people to put their eyes onto, but this time I want to just talk about a general sector of our hobby, tabletop gaming's print and play scene. Now many gamers may not realize just how many games and how many creators 
are, are represented in the print and play scene and the uh, sheer amount of competitions and the, the importance in developing your skills as a game designer and participating in this scene. Now, this is coming out of a recent interview that I did with Mark Tuck, who's a print and play designer. He recently won a contest with a dexterity game, which eventually became Squirreling Around, which is on Kickstarter and how I originally sourced the interview with him. But for the most part, this interview was largely focused on just his development as a print and play designer, how he got into the scene, the, the things that really challenged him and how he integrated himself into this community and eventually won the most recent Golden Geek Award for Orchard, a nine card solitaire card game. I asked him, how could someone who wanted to design games in the print and play scene get involved with the community? The things that they would need to know going in were things that would help them focus on creating these games. And he had this to say. Focus on a, on a sort of what makes your game different. If it's a sort of single mechanic or idea that makes it a bit different and then maybe build a, a theme around it. Um, you know, a theme is always quite uh, attractive, brings a game to life. Um, and um, enter into a contest then. I mean, there's plenty of them at any one point. There's always a contest going on or one or two contests going on at Board Game Geek. You know, there's a solitaire contest, there's a two-player contest. As I said, as I mentioned earlier, there's a 18-card, 9-card. Um, I find that they're a great way to... Um, to be creative or to sort of get your creative juices flowing because you have to work within a certain constraint. Sometimes if somebody's just thinking, oh, design a game, it can be a bit scary, you know, <laughs> how yeah. big is it going to be? What's the theme, you know? What, what, whereas if you're working within the parameters of a contest, uh, it tends to focus your mind a bit. And I think that's a great way to, uh, to be uh, creative. Um, and, um, as you said, the, the community there is a is a fantastic way to get feedback on on your game. That interview is going to post onto this channel the day after off the table post, so stay tuned for that and just check out some of the wild print and play games out there. It is such a cool, inventive, and creative scene with all kinds of games that you can make on the cheap. Now. That is going to take us to our question section because we're talking about print and play games. I want to know from you, what are some of the games that you have created in the past? Because chances are, if you are that alpha gamer, you're the person who has the wall of games, you're the person who's watching a news video about tabletop games, that at some point in your life, you created a game. Whether it's the Hero Quest knockoff that I did with my older brother and my best friend Ryan when we were kids, coming up with all of the different characters and weird map layouts and the, the trash that I absolutely created, or it was the zombie board game that I created with little wooden hexagons and I hand drew all the characters and then digitally reproduced them like when I was first getting into Catan and thought I knew everything about board games at that point and whoa boy was I wrong. I want to hear about your attempts. Were they successful? Did you get other people to play them? Have you ever revisited them? And if you are a game designer, what have been some of your efforts that led you to the point where you are now and some advice that you would like to share with others? Put that in the comments below. And that is going to do it for this episode of the Cardboard Heralds Off the Table. Thank you so much for watching. Thank you for all your support. It means the world to us. Please stay tuned for all the cool stuff we have on the horizon, including that Mark Tuck interview for his Kickstarter squirreling around. Well, and we talk about print and play games mainly and all kinds of stuff under the sun. That's going to be on the channel tomorrow. So, once again, thank you for watching. I've been Jack for the Cardboard Herald, and I'll talk to you next week. If you enjoyed this video, we have all kinds of other reviews, interviews, and recommendations via writing, podcasts, and video here on our channel and website, CardboardHerald.com. Our content is audience-supported, so if you want to show your support, please visit our Patreon. Thank you so much for watching. This has been the Cardboard Herald.